Hi there everyone. Good afternoon to those of us who are joining us in the Western Hemisphere for our first panel in a series of three entitled How to Reach Net Zero Decarbonisation and Carbon Markets. So we are joined today by Mark Lewis, who is the Head of Climate Research at Andiran Capital, and my colleague, who is Director at Net Zero Markets, Kareem Kanji. I do feel like, given that the two of you have about three decades of combined experience in environmental markets, we might be slightly underutilizing your respective skills in this sector. But I guess that means the audience can just rest reassured that they can take anything that you say as trustworthy. Um, we will have 10 minutes for questions at the end of this session. So please make sure that you are sending your questions into the question tab and not the chat tab. I will do my best to filter out the questions and ask some of them to Kareem and Mark towards the end. And if there are any that you that we miss because we run out of time in the next hour, you can also reach out to us on LinkedIn or through our respective websites at Net Zero Markets on Twitter or the website. Um, and so with that, Mark, would you like to take it away? Thank you very much, Tiffany, and good afternoon, good morning to everybody who's uh, joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Net Zero Markets for the uh, um, invitation to be with you this afternoon. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes, giving a general introduction to why decarbonization matters for investors and for corporates, why net zero specifically matters for investors and corporates, and then talk a little bit about uh, the different kinds of scope of emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, and then finish up with some comments on the differences between global uh, compliance markets, that is to say carbon markets where there is a, uh, a compliance obligation uh, to meet and what we currently refer to as the voluntary carbon market, um, the offset market, but which as I will uh, explain, I think is going to undergo quite a radical structural change over the next few years as a result of what happened at the Glasgow COP in 2021. So with that said, um, if we could go to my presentation, please, and the slides that I have ready. Um, so um, we're talking about decarbonization and carbon markets and how to reach net zero. Um, let me begin with just a very, very uh, 30,000 feet bird's eye view of why decarbonization matters and then why specifically net zero matters to investors and to corporates. Because climate change is one of these topics that uh, we all read about in the news all the time or increasingly. Um, but why does it matter to investors and why does it matter to corporates? And I think the first thing to say is um, the scientific study of climate change has really been around now in a structured global fashion since 1988. That was the first, uh, that was the date of the first publication by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a UN convened body of uh, scientific researchers who have now published, the most recent one last year, uh, six so-called assessment reports on the science of climate change. So over the last uh, 35 years, we've really been getting a, a clearer and clearer picture of the impact of climate change on the planet and on um, the biosphere. And um, from a scientific point of view, therefore, the knowledge has been building and the urgency to act has been increasing. Um, if you think about the global policy response to this and why policymakers have become concerned about it, um, really, it was a success that the UN process to deal with climate change began in the 1990s under the so-called uh, Conference of the Parties, the COP. You'll know that better, the, the term better known as the COP. Uh, there is an annual meeting every year of all uh, members of the United Nations um, framework Convention on Climate Change, uh, the most recent one having taken place in Egypt in November of last year. The most famous one probably being the one in Paris in, in December 2015, COP21, which resulted in the Paris Agreement. And so if we think about why investors and corporates should be concerned about climate change, it's really because the science has uh, become clearer and clearer. It's become more impressed upon global political leaders that there is a need to act and there is a need to act in concert 
globally uh, to uh, prevent the worst aspects of climate change. And in order to achieve that, we need to decarbonize. The essential problem of climate change is that there is too much, there are too many heat trapping gases in the atmosphere and man-made emissions um, from the burning of fossil fuels mainly. There are agricultural emissions and emissions from waste as well, but really it's a combustion of fossil fuels, which has led to most of the man-made emissions that have gone into the atmosphere since the industrial revolution. And it's very clear if you look at the scientific literature that there's been a uh, clear uh, increase in emissions from, let's say, the late 18, uh, 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. And this has uh, had increasing concentrations of um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and very strongly correlated with increasing temperatures. Now, the global average temperature has so far increased since pre-industrial times by about one degree centigrade or a little over one degree centigrade. And the Paris Agreement committed uh, the world and the signatories to the Paris Agreement, which is essentially every country that is a member of the United Nations, to uh, limiting the increase in the global average temperature to no more than two degrees as compared with pre-industrial, uh, the pre-industrial level of, of um, average temperature. And as I said, we've already, we've already reached warming of more than one degree, a little over one degree. So um, what climate scientists have been doing since the late 90s is calculating so-called carbon budgets to say this is how much more uh, this is how much more carbon we can put into the atmosphere before we tip over the threshold of two degrees. So there are carbon budgets commensurate with different levels of global warming versus the pre-industrial uh, level. Now, um, so in a nutshell, that's why decarbonization matters. It matters because global policymakers have made this a priority and increasingly around the world, in, at the country level, at the regional level, and at the um, jurisdictional level in places like California, um, policymakers are responding to the challenge, in many cases, by putting in place carbon pricing regimes, which I'll come to in a moment. And I think it's worth saying, if we think about the pricing of uh, carbon, um, what are we actually pricing? Are we pricing the emissions? Or what? to put it another way, in eco pure economic terms, what is the scarce resource that we are pricing when we put a price on carbon emissions? Because Economics 101, the, the pricing mechanism exists to allocate scarce resources. That is the economic problem. How do you allocate scarce resources in the most efficient way? That's why we have markets. That's why we have the pricing mechanism. And the scarce resource that we're actually trying to price when we put a price on carbon emissions is the limited amount of space left in the atmosphere for further concentrations of greenhouse gases before we tip over these temperature thresholds. So in a nutshell, that's why we care about decarbonization and why investors and corporates have to care about decarbonization because policymakers care about it. Now, um, from the abstract or the, or the general concept of decarbonization, why does net zero matter so much? Well, the essential reason is that every... Um, every uh, increase in the, or every increment in the average global temperature um, makes a big difference. And as part of the uh, climate change deal struck in Paris in 2015, which is really what is now defining the global policy response to climate change, um, the, um, the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, was asked by uh, the countries that signed up to the Paris Agreement to prepare a report that would compare two degrees of warming with 1.5 degrees of warming and see what the difference was. Because although the Paris text states that the uh, minimum effort is to prevent warming of no more than two degrees, in fact, there is also uh, in the text of the Paris Agreement this comment which says that um, make best efforts to uh, um, to uh, limit the increase to no more than 1.5 degrees. And ever since 2018 and the publication of a landmark report by the IPCC called Special Report on Global Warming of 1.5 degrees centigrade, we have learned that the difference between global warming of 1.5 degrees and, one, and global warming of two degrees is very significant indeed. And that is what this slide here is telling us. So for a range of different uh, impacts, you can look here 
at the impact on heat. You can look at and, and you can look at heat waves, the impact on sea ice uh, in the Arctic, sea level rise, species loss of you know whether it's vertebrates, plants, or uh, insects. Um, for a whole range of climate indicators, um, the difference between one and a half degrees and two degrees is very significant indeed. And uh, for example, if you look at the proportion of the global population that would be exposed to severe heat at least once every five years, under a two degree scenario, that is 2.6 times worse than it is under 1.5 degrees. Look at sea ice in the Arctic, it's 10, time wor 10 times worse under two degrees than under 1.5 degrees. So for this entire range of indicators, it's very, very clear that the more we can do to limit the increase in the average global temperature as a result of uh, climate change and burning fossil fuels, the better, because every tenth of a degree, in fact, makes a huge difference. And this is why, since 2018, the debate on climate change has really become all about net zero, because what net zero really means is if we can get to net zero emissions globally by 2050, and of course, that's only... 27 years away now, uh, then we can probably, the, the balance of probability suggests that we can limit the increase in the average global temperature to no more than one and a half degrees as compared with two degrees. Unfortunately, at the moment, the trajectory of emissions is well above uh, two degrees. But um, the reason the debate around climate change now is focused so much on this question of net zero is that it is consistent with limiting the increase in emission in the average global temperature to no more than 1.5 degrees and that makes an enormous difference as compared with an increase of two degrees so this is why ever since 2018 the conversation amongst policymakers and therefore by definition the, the conversation amongst uh, investors and corporates has really become about net zero and how we get to net zero. This is why you hear quite often now companies making net zero pledges. It's why you hear the European Union has recently uh, committed legally to achieving net zero emissions by uh, 2050, the UK, uh, California. There are many jurisdictions around the world that have this net zero ambition by 2050. And therefore, investors and corporates are having to think about their capital allocation decisions and invest their capital in a way that is consistent with a trajectory that meets the 1.5 degree uh, trajectory by 2050. So that's that's why it matters. It matters because global policymakers are putting us on this pathway, or trying at least to put us on this pathway to one and a half degrees. And if you if you carry on investing as if this is not going to make a difference to your portfolio or to your business, then you risk. Uh, incurring significant financial losses over time as that policy response accelerates and increases and as clean energy technologies become cheaper and cheaper over time. And by the way, I think it's worth uh, saying, and one of the reasons I'm personally most optimistic about our ability to meet the net zero target by the middle of this century is that it's not just policy, it's technology that matters. And the good news about clean energy technologies is that they are inherently deflationary by nature whereas fossil fuels are inherently inflationary. What do I mean by that? I mean quite simply that uh, fossil fuels get depleted over time and you move up the cost curve as you are forced to uh, explore for more expensive resources over time. If you think about um, the clean energy cost curve, uh, by contrast, clean energy um, is really all about um, you don't really have to explore for it and you don't have to produce it. You simply have to build infrastructure at the point the energy is available and capture that energy. And once you've built the infrastructure, when the wind blows, when the sun shines, the energy itself arrives for free. And what that means in turn is the more of that infrastructure you build, you get economies of scale effects, which reduce the cost over time. That's why I say that clean energy uh, is inherently deflationary and fossil fuels are inherently inflationary. Um, so that's the background, the scientific background. If we if we move on to think about how we should be thinking about it and, and thinking about emissions, and we can go to the next slide, please. Um, we, we have a terminology around emissions, which to people who are new to this topic can sometimes be confusing because there are different scopes, so-called scopes 
of carbon emissions, scope one, scope two, and scope three. Scope one is very easy to understand. Those are the emissions that occur, occur at the point of combustion. So if I'm a power generator and I burn coal or I burn gas to produce electricity, um, the emissions that come out of my smokestack, that is a scope one emission. Scope two and scope three emissions are the indirect emissions in the value chain. So if you think, what are scope two emissions? Scope two emissions are the indirect emissions you incur if you consume electricity in your home or in your factory. Um, uh, that is to say, um, somebody else is, burn is actually burning those fuels. You're consuming them, but you are still, uh, uh, you are still nonetheless responsible uh, in some way for those emissions because it's your demand that is leading to that uh, those emissions in the first place and scope three emissions and you can see on this slide here there's a very broad range of, of scope three emissions these are the indirect emissions right across uh, the value chain um, for a company for example it's the emissions of their staff traveling back and forth from work or business travel but it's all the emissions associated with delivering end goods to uh, the final consumer. Um, we don't have time to go into this in detail, but this chart really, I think, is a very powerful uh, graphic um, representation of the differences between those. Now, for most companies, um, in fact, it's the indirect emissions that are most important because it's really the power generation sector globally accounts for about 25% of all man-made greenhouse gas emissions. And those are clearly scope one emissions. If I'm a power generator, the emissions I, I, um, I'm responsible for when I burn coal or burn gas are very clearly my emissions uh, at the scope one level. Um, scope two, and in particular scope three emissions, some of those can be more difficult to measure. But if you think, for example, about an oil and gas company, an oil and gas company sells oil, sells gas, and uh, because oil is mainly burned in transportation, whether it be you, know, you driving your car or a train or a ship or a plane, um, those emissions are not directly incurred by oil companies, but because it's the oil companies that develop those resources and sell them on, there is a scope three responsibility for those emissions. And this is why increasingly um, companies that have significant scope three carbon footprints are being uh, pressured really by civil society, even if there is not a direct um, compliance obligation for them to uh, reduce those emissions because they are not the direct responsibility of those companies. Um, there is an indirect responsibility and therefore many uh, large companies now um, habitually uh, offset their scope three emissions via the purchase of, of carbon credits, even if there is not a compliance obligation on them to do that. Um, so that brings us to this question, finally, of compliance markets and voluntary markets. And if we can move to the next slide, please. Um, we will see that um, the uh, difference between compliance markets and voluntary markets, and I, I still don't, there we go. Um, compliance markets are markets where the regulator has put in place a legal obligation on companies, the companies covered by the scheme, to reduce their emissions over time in line with the declining total volume of uh, emissions allowed in the scheme. So if we take the largest compliance market in the world at the moment by a value, that is the European uh, emissions trading system. This has been in operation since 2005. The EU ETS covers up nearly 50% of all European industrial emissions. And in accordance with the deal that the European institutions reached just before Christmas, literally less than a month ago, um, we now know that the total cap on carbon emissions in Europe for the companies covered by that scheme will decline um, at a rate from 2028 onwards at 4.4% a year, which means the cap reaches zero by 2038. Now, what does that mean? It means that after 2038, European companies covered by the EU ETS will no longer be able to emit any CO2 at all. So there's a very strong uh, compliance obligation on them to start investing in a way that will allow them in low carbon, zero carbon technologies that will enable them to be completely emissions free by 
2030. So that's compliance markets. There's a legal obligation to achieve it. If you don't achieve it, uh, you get fined. And it, this is all done under the pollution, polluter pays uh, principle. And uh, over time, it creates an incentive because precisely because the number of allowances is getting scarcer over time, then over time, uh, the value of those allowances, the price of carbon should increase to a level that enables the uh, public policy objective to, to be met. Now, the voluntary market is very different. The voluntary market is not regulated by any public authority, and it consists of emissions reduction projects that generate carbon credits or offsets. Um, and the, the main market for this, as I said earlier, is really companies that want to be seen to be reducing their carbon footprint over time. And typically, this is the scope three footprint. I should have said, should have specified in compliance markets, it's exclusively scope one emissions that are covered because those are the easiest to measure. So in the European uh, market, for example, the power generation sector is covered. Um, the chemical sector, the steel sector, the cement sector, all of the heavy industri industrial users that burn uh, fossil fuels and create, create carbon emissions at the point of combustion themselves. Um, in the voluntary market, it's different. There's a, the, the main demand there has come from corporates that want to reduce their carbon footprint, but it's typically their scope two or actually even more so their, their scope three footprint, which is being uh, covered there. If we just go to my final two slides, I'll, I'll go into each of these points in, in slightly more detail. So next slide, please. Um, just to say an extra word on compliance markets. Um, compliance markets, you know, if you're covered by them, you have to meet the uh, compliance requirement. I think it's worth pointing out just from a, um, a, a sort of, a a perspective, give you a perspective on compliance markets. Um, compliance markets are environmental policies. What you're trying to do is to solve for quantity rather than solve for price. In other words, what you say is the total amount of emissions every year is going to be uh, this level and over time it declines. And then, the, then you let the market figure out what the price of those emissions should be over time. But you're really solving for quantity. You're getting to zero. If you think of carbon taxes, carbon taxes are first and foremost a financial policy tool rather than an environmental policy tool because it's the opposite. It's the other way around. You're solving uh, for price. You set a price on carbon and then you, the price then dictates what the quantity of uh, emissions will be. So although there are, there's a lot of overlap and a lot of you know, clearly both of them have both a financial and an environmental impact. Compliance uh, markets, traded carbon markets, are really a very pure environmental tool using the genius of markets to put a price on scarce resources so that we achieve decarbonization and net zero in the most efficient way possible. Um, and then to conclude, just with my final slide on um, voluntary markets, I said in my comments earlier, um, the, the voluntary market as it exists today and as it has existed for the last uh, decade and a half, two decades, is really there at the moment for companies that want to, to buy uh, emissions reductions that have been verified by third parties and um, to offset against their carbon footprint carbon footprint that by definition will not be covered by a, by a compliance scheme. Now, the important point I want to make and leave you with to think about is that this market, I think, is going to change. This, the, the, the nature of this market is going to change over the next few years because at the Glasgow COP a year and a half ago or 18 months ago, um, the um, decision was reached under so-called Article 6 of the Paris Agreement to... Uh, bring, if you like, the, the physical emissions reductions required to meet the Paris Agreement and the accounting of greenhouse gas emissions reductions globally together under one umbrella in the sense that what, what will happen in the future, you will have uh, emissions reduction products, uh, emissions re reduction projects established in countries and it will be for the, it will be for the government in those countries to determine whether 
those those the credits from those uh, emissions reduction projects receive a so-called corresponding adjustment or not. And credits that receive a corresponding adjustment, which is, is another way of saying, if I have a project, let's say in a country like Brazil, it will be for the Brazilian government to determine whether it wants to use the emissions reductions of a given project for its own account to help achieve its own Paris Agreement targets, or if it says, well, actually, I'm, I'm fine, I can meet my Paris uh, Agreement targets anyway, and I will sell that project and I'll give you a corresponding adjustment, which is a, if you like, a stamp of approval, uh, which says Brazil is not using that that credit for its own purposes. And those credits, credits in future which have a corresponding adjustment, I think, will attract a premium to other kinds of voluntary credits in the market, because if you like, they have the stamp of approval of the accounting system of the uh, of the uh, Paris Agreement. So that is something to look for going forward. We're in this transition phase at the moment from the pure voluntary market, as we have known it over the last two decades, towards, I think, a more variegated market, a, a, a subtler market where there are credits that have a corresponding adjustment and attract a premium and other purer sort of voluntary credits which do not have that quasi-regulatory nature. And I think the other the, the other virtue of credits that will have corresponding adjustments in future is that they will by definition have a quasi-compliant status because they've been validated by the Paris Agreement effectively. They're consistent with the accounting system of the Paris Agreement. And so it's possible to imagine a future where uh, voluntary credits that have a a corresponding adjustment attached to them can be used in uh, compliance schemes such as the European emissions trading system. That's not on the agenda at the moment, I hasten to add, but it's certainly a scenario in the future that one could imagine. And uh, with that, I will hand over to Kareem for his section of the presentation. Thank you very much for that, Mark. You are perfectly on time with that. Kareem, it is half past. Thanks very much, Mark, and thanks, Tiffany. I'm just going to bring up my presentation quickly. I hope you can all see that. Uh, my name is Kareem Kanji. I work um, as a director uh, for a company called Net Zero Markets. Um, we've organised these um, webinars to, to help um, people understand uh, more about corporate offsetting. Um, and Net Zero Markets is a company dedicated to um, creating uh, risk management risk management products for the environmental markets. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of uh, carbon credits out there in the market at the moment. Uh, I'm going to go through the um, various different players active uh, across the entire value chain of the voluntary carbon market. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the different methodologies, um, different types of credits, as I already mentioned. Um, talk about um, the, the different aspects in terms of pricing, um, some of the issues that arise with certain types of um, carbon credits. Uh, I'm also going to go through some history in terms of the data, in terms of um, how many credits have been issued and how many have been retired. Uh, and then finally, talk a little bit about um, different approaches to offsetting uh, that corporates can choose to follow. At the start, um, this is a diagrammatic representation of the entire voluntary carbon market value chain. Uh, I, I've been working in carbon markets since 2005, and, and, and I've got quite used to using various acronyms and, and shorthand uh, ways of uh, calling things. But I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible. Um, but please, please raise your hand or please ask in the, in, in, in the section below if, um, if there's anything that I've covered too quickly and, and you want me to go back over and cover. So starting uh, on the left hand side, um, the carbon credit is created when a project um, assists in reducing emissions. So project developers are companies who go out and look for opportunities um, to reduce emissions um, in various different manners. So the way they do this is to um, Identify, identify projects, identify opportunities, um, raise investment um, from banks and other funds, work with technical partners on the feasibility of different types of projects, uh, and then work with independent validators and verifiers to make to not only measure um, how much how much emissions are being reduced, 
um, but, but also to form a baseline against which those uh, reductions can be measured against. When the, when the project um, is, uh, is uh, defined and is uh, started to take shape, the, they can be registered with, um, moving on to the next bubble, uh, they can be registered with various standards and registries. You, you may have heard of some of these, for example, um, VERA, Gold Standard, um, Climate Action Reserve, uh, make up um, part of the big four. Um, the, the, the first bullet point there, the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, was set up by the UN, um, which was one of the first uh, project-based um, registries in existence. Um, they started in the early 2000s and that created credits known as CERs, Certified Emission Reductions, which could be used within the EU ETS up until quite recently. Now, the standards and registries um, play two roles really in this market. Uh, not only um, they act as standard bearers, so that means that they um, are responsible for making sure that projects meet certain standards um, are, and create methodologies by which reductions can be measured, um, but they also play the role of a registry. So um, they issue credits to projects um, where each credit represents one tonne of carbon dioxide um, reduced. So they play, they play, really play a, a, a dual role in this market. Um, so I mentioned already the, the big four. There are new standards um, coming online. So the Global Carbon Council, again, Mark mentioned earlier, um, is another example of theirs. Um, the UK Woodland Code is another. Um, other types of standards include co-benefit accreditors. So, so as well as reducing carbon dioxide, we'll come on to see that um, carbon reduction projects can also help uh, in other ways, in other forms. For example, um, help, helping communities, um, helping reduce poverty, uh, those kinds of things, helping biodiversity. And there are companies who will accredit uh, and provide assurance that projects are actually doing what they say they're, they're doing in terms of helping communities and helping biodiversity, et cetera. There are other registries which, um, which, uh, which count carbon credits and issue carbon credits and, uh, and keep a count of retirement of carbon credits. And then there are meta registries, for example, um, recently launched by HS Market uh, and the World Bank is also involved in, uh, in a meta registry. So this enables you to keep track of carbon credits, credits across um, across the existing registries. Uh, so rather than having them all in different places, you can access them in, 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 in one place. Now, that, as I already mentioned, that the, the carbon standards role is to, um, is to make sure that projects are doing what they say they are doing in terms of uh, the number of, uh, or the amount of carbon dioxide um, that's being reduced. However, uh, as most of you are probably aware, um, there's been quite a lot of debate and quite a lot of controversy about how much carbon dioxide is actually being reduced by some of these projects. And so there's been a, a kind of side industry um, that sprung up. Uh, and, and the point of this side industry is to provide um, a quality assurance uh, and ratings for projects. Um, there are a multitude of companies offering these kinds of services. Um, again, offsetters um, can can employ these companies as independent um, independent arbiters of quality. So, as an example, B Zero provide um, ratings uh, in the form of uh, very very similar to the to, to the role that um, Fitch or Moody's or Standard and Poor's would play in the bond market uh, in terms of assessing the quality of a project and assigning it a rating uh, from triple A to triple B, as a, as an example. So moving forward, um, once, a, once a carbon credit has been um, registered, has, so once a project has been approved and a carbon credit has been uh, issued by one of these standards and the carbon credit is registered on a registry, so it's counted there, um, the next step and the next bubble along to the right um, really involves the transfer of these credits from um, the project developers and the companies who are involved with the creation of the credit um, this is the kind of marketplace 
where credits are transferred from um, project uh, creators to project users, so from the from the producer to the consumer, effectively. And there are various different methods um, by which credits can be sold. Um, so exchanges and platforms really is the is is the wholesale market. So this is the market in which um, larger companies, um, either project developers or on, on the production side or um, banks or aggregators or offsetting uh, companies. So companies who are involved in uh, uh, companies you can employ to help you with your offsetting, um, they may purchase in large volumes from larger project developers on exchanges and platforms such as um, the EEX and Air Carbon. So these are wholesale, these are large transactions, uh, very low fees, um, very very liquid, um, usually very liquid. Um, but generally, um, this isn't where corporates go to buy their credits, or it, this isn't where um, this isn't for small transactions, not for retail. It's very much wholesale. Um, the bubble below that retail is is really is really um, where you talk about companies who help other corporates with their offsetting. So they'll help uh, measure. Um, your carbon footprint, they'll help um, provide you with a, a, an array of different types of credits. Um, they'll help you choose which credits you should be buying. Those kinds of, those kinds of activities. Uh, above that is brokers. So this, they work with exchanges and platforms. And really here I'm talking about wholesale brokers, um, assisting in large wholesale transactions of credits, uh, high value transactions, large volumes, um, tens, hundreds, millions of tons worth of carbon dioxide, those types of transactions um, get performed by brokers on, in, the, in the wholesale market. There's also, um, above that, there's also the blockchain and crypto market, which has developed over the last couple of years, um, which is a kind of a, a bit of a sideshow to what we're talking about today, but is obviously um, gained a lot of interest and gained um, gained a lot of publicity, and also can be very active, um, and is relatively accessible for retail for retail investors as well as um, institutional investors. The moving over to the last couple of bubbles on the right hand side is really the kind of consumer of um, consumer of carbon credits. Um, there's the voluntary offsetters. So that's obviously corporates and individuals who are looking to offset their um, their own carbon dioxide emissions, um, the standard buyers who would um, either approach a retailer or perhaps if, they're, if, the, if their volume is large enough, um, sign up to an exchange or a platform, purchase credits and then retire them uh, in, in their own name and publish that information saying that they have, um, this, is how many, uh, this is how many carbon dioxide tons that they've offset. Um, the other, the other option for buyers, the other type of buyer really are investors and traders. So that here you have um, companies looking to either um, purchase with the intent of selling later in terms of investments, hoping for a, a, an increase in price, or traders looking for a faster turnaround, um, helping aid liquidity, um, helping provide buyers when it's needed and helping um, provide a seller when that's needed, um, just so that the market continues to function. Uh, they play a very important role, um, but they're not. They're, they're perhaps not necessarily buying to retire. The final bubble at the bottom there is the standards for corporate claims. So this is um, again a, a relatively new um, breed of a new breed of body, I would say. Um, the likes of the um, Science Based Targets Initiative, the BCMI, um, basically helping. Uh, provides some uh, guidelines for corporates um, in terms of how they should how they should be buying offset offset credits, uh, how they should be using them, um, helping them form a, a pathway, helping them set targets, um, and it's an again an in, a kind of independent uh, guide um, for how corporate offsetting should be done. And we'll talk a bit we'll talk a bit more about those um, in the in the next few slides. So to talk a little bit about the different types of carbon credits um, that are in existence today, as I mentioned, um, a carbon project is defined by a methodology which is published by the various standards. 
Um, so this, the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, uh, originally started and created and wrote methodologies for which um, uh, a baseline or a business as usual um, could be could be set out and then a project could be measured against that baseline or against that business as usual emissions to work out how many emissions have been uh, or how by how much emissions have been reduced uh, and and different technologies and different project types have different ways of measuring how much um, how, how effective they've been and how much carbon dioxide has been reduced so each of these different types of carbon credit has a has a methodology associated with it um, and since since the CDM um, produced these methodologies, uh, other standards such as the the big four, which are um, shown here, Vera, Gold Standard, Climate Action Reserve, and the American Carbon Registry, have continued to work on these methodologies, bringing them up to date, um, continuing to make them relevant, but also developing new methodologies all the time um, as technology improves and as uh, different types of projects are identified. So if we um, very quickly go around this wheel, you can see that the, um, the various types of carbon credits are divided into eight, around eight different uh, larger categories. The most commonly um, heard about ones, I suppose, are renewable energy projects. So this is where a company invests in rene uh, renewable energy type plants, so whether that's solar or hydropower or geothermal or wind. Uh, and this displaces um, fossil fuel generation and therefore reduces um, the amount of emissions being produced and that can that's quite easily measured um, and so the investors and the and the projects are um, rewarded with carbon credits for that activity another another very obvious um, form of um, emission reduction is energy efficiency so things like fuel switching so switching away from one type of from burning a, a dirtier fuel to a cleaner fuel um, things like lighting efficiency, so using um, LED light bulb bulbs instead of halogen, um, where you get the same amount of light but for less energy requirements. Um, uh, quite easy, again, quite easy to, to measure the impact um, that the projects are, are, are having, um, both in a, in a large scale, uh, but also in, in that green uh, quadrant, you can see the household and community type projects um, where very similar energy efficiency type savings can be made. So lighting, clean water, clean cook stoves, um, water purification, biogas, and general energy efficiency type projects. The other, um, the other very common type of carbon credit, and one which most of you will, will have come across, um, involves forestry, forestry land use um, and agriculture. So that's the, 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 the couple of sectors there in the purple and darker green on the left hand side of this graphic. Um, so, of course, um, the way we use our land and the way we use our sea um, uh, contributes massively to um, carbon, uh, carbon emissions. Trees obviously um, are responsible, trees and general agriculture, general planting are, are responsible for soaking up carbon dioxide, cutting down trees, burning trees, um, releases that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So the, the, the two main types of forestry carbon credits are uh, the simplest to understand, I guess, is uh, afforestation and reforestation. So that's where a project developer will identify some land um that that is capable of hosting um forestries and uh, goes and plants new trees in that land uh, which help reduce uh, help suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere the the, the probably the largest um uh, sector of carbon credits um in this in this section is red plus so that is uh, avoided deforestation so this is where um, a project developer can identify uh, uh, a large forest or a large amount of land where there are trees um, which are due to be cut down for some reason or another, usually for farming. Um, and by paying the owner of that land um, some money raised through the proceeds of carbon selling carbon credits, um, which is equivalent to the, the kind of money that they would get by chopping the trees down and using the land for farming, um, they can keep the trees there instead, uh, and so those trees are not only do they not 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 only do they not release 
carbon dioxide in, into the atmosphere, but they continue to um, soak up CO2 over time. The other, type, the other types of uh, carbon credits, I mean, the, the, there are just so many, and um, so I won't go through all of them, but transport is obviously a big sector. Transport's responsible for a huge amount of emissions. And so reducing um, emissions from transportation is, um, is, is ripe for um, carbon credit projects. Um, other types of agriculture, so um, nitrogen management with um, fertilizer. Um, so it's it's not only CO2 that's um, at issue here, it's also it's the other greenhouse gases too. Um, you can see in the chemical and industrial section there in the blue on the right hand side, um, HF, um, HFC, N2O, other types of um, chemicals, reducing the emissions of those chemicals, which are, which are actually, um, and, and which gases are actually much more powerful and have a much greater global warming effect um, are also, um, uh, are also relevant for carbon carbon projects. So moving on, as well as the as well as the different type of um, technologies, there are there are other as well as the different types of projects. There are also various other um, important attributes to carbon credits to consider when you look at um, what you're going to purchase. So I already mentioned the additional accreditations. Um, so this is where um, a carbon credit is responsible or a carbon project is responsible not only for reducing carbon dioxide emissions, but also for helping increase biodiversity, um, helping with communities, um, helping eradicate poverty, um, the kind of things that are covered by the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, so the SDGs, um, of which there are um, various ones. And um, projects can be measured uh, in terms of their effective effectiveness for how how well they're addressing these uh, sustainable development goals, and they can be given additional accreditations from the likes of the gold standard for the global goals. Um, SD Vista is various version of of, of, of those. Um, there are also other other standards you can reach social carbon and uh, the CCBA. Uh, which assess how good, how well a carbon project is um, helping biodiversity and helping community. And um, when you when you buy a when you buy one of these carbon credits, you can check that they have been accredited by these various bodies to make sure that they are doing what what they say they're doing. Other important factors uh, when considering which carbon credits to buy are the location of the project. So some offsetters liked like to buy um, carbon credits um, that have been produced in countries where the corporate has um, uh, has operations themselves um, and similarly with vintage so the um, when the carbon reduction actually took place um, can be an important factor uh, in deciding which carbon credits uh, to use for offsetting Now, these three terms um, address uh, some of the issues um, that you may hear about or read about um, with, in, with respect to carbon credits. So they, um, they're three of the things uh, which define a good carbon credit and which each of the big four standards and all the other standards actually um, look to um, make sure have been addressed uh, before a project is given carbon credits. So permanence um, is important because uh, CO2 that's emitted into the atmosphere remains there for um, hundreds and thousands of years. And so when, when, a carbon, when a carbon project reduces emissions, that reduction should also be permanent. And problems arise um, usually uh, where the CO2, where the carbon dioxide has been stored in some kind of reservoir or some kind of sink that is only temporary. Um, th the easiest example is uh, trees which store carbon dioxide. If those trees are subsequently um, either burnt down or chopped down, that releases the, the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. And so there's carbon credits, the carbon credit reduction that's taken place by planting those trees or keep making sure the trees aren't chopped down um, is said to not be permanent. Um, so that's it's an important thing to measure. It's an important thing to ascertain um, uh, when looking at, at a carbon credit to make sure that the reductions are permanent. 
additionality is really um, one of the most basic facets of a, of a carbon credit. Um, and what, addition, what additionality means is that the carbon reduction is additional. So um, it, it is, uh, it, it's new, it's something that's actually taken place um, because of the market for carbon credits and wouldn't have happened otherwise. So this is really important when uh, looking at um, baseline and uh, business as usual emissions and making sure that those business as usual and baseline emissions are realistic and that the project is only taking place because of the revenue from the carbon credits and wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so additionally, additionality changes over time. Um, as an, a, a good example that I've seen over the years is um, renewable energy projects, solar projects and wind farms, which, um, which 15 years ago were uh, too expensive um, and, and uneconomic to build um, only because of the energy that they create, because that, because that technology has become cheaper and cheaper, um, and because the prices of fossil fuels, as, as, as Mark Lewis mentioned earlier, yeah, is inflationary, whereas the technology um, for renewable energy is deflationary, as those two have crossed over, it actually now makes much more sense to build renewable energy than it does to build new fossil fuel type um, general energy, energy generation. And so renewable energy projects don't really need the revenue um, from carbon credits. And so those renewable energy projects are effectively no longer additional, at least in, in developed countries um, with, high, with high electricity and gas prices. So that's, um, so that's additionality. It can, be, it can be hard to ascertain um, because um, you, you can look at various hurdle rates and, you know, uh, even if a project is um, is creating a two or three percent return on investment, i.e., it is profitable, um, it may not take place because of hurdle rates, etc. Um, and so this is um, it's it's a difficult area, uh, but it's one that's important to um, to check when when assessing a carbon credit or a carbon project. Um, finally, leakage um, leakage occurs when um, a carbon, a carbon project reduces emissions in one place, which um, has a knock-on effect of creating extra emissions somewhere else. So rather than the project actually reducing emissions totally, all you're doing is shifting the location of those emissions. And obviously um, that, that shouldn't be rewarded. And so carbon credits should not be rewarded to projects that just move emissions from one place to another. And that's, uh, that's what we call it. That's what we in the market call leakage. Now, moving on to um, the data, this chart uh, shows uh, issuances and retirements of carbon credits um, going back to 2002. The dark blue line uh, at the bottom is the number of um, carbon credits retired each year. And you can see that that's grown fairly steadily, but has really taken off in the last three or four years, reaching a high in 2021 of just over 160 million tonnes. Um, worth of carbon credits retired in 2021. Um, last year, 2022's numbers were fairly flat. So the first, the 2022 compared to 2021, the first year in some time that the market hasn't really grown. However, um, ov obviously quite a lot of headwinds last year, both in terms of um, the market itself, but also general geopolitical and um, economic headwinds uh, against um, the voluntary carbon market. So actually for, their, for, the, for retirements to be flat year on year last year, I think is, is, is fairly positive for the market um, given everything that was going on. Um, the lighter blue line at the top are uh, carbon credit issuances. So this is the number of carbon credits each year that are newly registered with the, um, with the various, uh, with the big four actually um, in, this, in this data, in this chart. Um, and you can see that's also grown massively um, over the years and continues to increase, but also showed us uh, a, a slight decline in 2022. Um, and there are various factors that, um, that have caused that decline um, in, in terms of issuance, um, which I won't go into here, but you can, you can read about elsewhere. 
Um, but the other thing to the other thing to um, notice on this chart is really that every pretty much every year um, more credits are issued than than retired. And so this, there is a surplus in the market that has built up over time and has continued to build up. Um, but going forwards with the restrictions in the types and number of projects that can be registered um, and the, the availability of effectively low hanging fruit in terms of carbon credits, um, that uh, surplus is likely to diminish over time. Um, and most forecasters are expecting the market to move into, into balance over the next five to 10 years. Now, a little bit about the different approaches to offsetting. So as corporates, um, uh, corporates have set out various targets. So that, uh, I wanted to explain a little bit about the difference between carbon neutrality versus net zero. Again, this is fa fairly basic, but I, just, I wanted to make sure that it's understood because um, the, the, the terminologies are bandied around. Um, and I think not necessarily always completely understood. So carbon neutral um, as a target really means that um, for every ton um, that a corporate is emitting, they're purchasing an offset. Um, so an, an, an emissions reduction somewhere else. So buying effectively buying a credit. But, but that's still, but that what that really means is that um, the business as usual case would be um, that uh, if the project hadn't taken place, then a ton of um, a ton of carbon would have been emitted um, in, in its place. But a company that wants to emit a, a new ton um, emits their ton and reduces uh, that the ton that would, wouldn't have taken place without the project. So effectively, you still end up with one ton being emitted. Uh, it's just emitted by the project um, rather than being emitted by the, by the, the project. Um, it's, being uh, it's being emitted by the person buying the credit. So there's still one ton being emitted. It's not, um, it's not carbon neutral. It doesn't mean that there's no emissions taking place. Um, net zero, on the other hand, um, means, as it says, net zero. So if a, if a ton of uh, carbon is put into the atmosphere, um, a matching ton is uh, taken out of the atmosphere. So that's different to the avoidance type of projects that, that we've been talking about. And that involves um, a, a different type of uh, carbon credit, so a, a removal carbon credit. The types of carbon, the, the types of removal credits are um, uh, f forestry carbon credits remove um, carbon carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, other types of removal credits include direct air capture. So this is where you're actually sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and um, and that and that offsets a, t a ton of emissions that you're putting out, and so you end up with net zero. And so most targets now are in terms of net zero by a certain a certain date. Um, there are various bodies that um, help corporates help set guidelines for corporates. Um, that a couple mentioned here: the Science Based Targets Initiative and the Oxford Offsetting Principles. Um, the chart on the right shows how um, they help set uh, pathways and help set targets. Um, so using, uh, using for example, um, short-term targets. Uh, we'd, so, so most corporates have a target for 2050 or 2040, um, which is obviously quite far in the future. So it's important to define a, a pathway with shorter-term targets as well as uh, longer-term targets. Um, they can help, um, they, they specify how those targets can be reached in terms of um, compensation. So um, compensation credits, so this is buying carbon offsets, um, and then eventually um, set out how net zero should be reached in terms of not only decarbonization, so reducing the amount of internal emissions that a, that a corporate puts out, um, but then when that's down to the, the minimum level possible, um, purchasing uh, removal credits to offset those emissions uh, so that the, the corporate reaches net zero. Finally, my last slide. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the GR, which is uh, the Global Emission Reduction, which is a, a product that Net Zero Markets has put together, which can help um, offsetters reach their offsetting goals um, by by providing a, a basket of different types of 
um, carbon credits in one product. Uh, not only is it a, a, a basket of um, carbon credits, but it also includes a small element of removals. And if you continue to buy the GR over time, that, that element of removals increases over time, much in the same way as the Science-Based Targets Initiative and the Oxford Principles suggest a pathway, a glide path to achieving net zero by slowly increasing the number of um, removal credits being purchased. The global emission reduction, the GR, has that built in as well as helping corporates um, purchase different types of carbon credits. So we've already shown that there's a bewildering different bewildering array of different types of projects and credits available in the markets, everything from renewables and energy efficiency to forestry, um, as well as uh, credits that have additional accreditation and sustainable development goals built into them. So the GER includes all of that in one product, um, uh, and is available at various retailers um, and provides an easy way for corporates to, um, to meet their offsetting goals. And that's really all from me. Thanks very much, Karim. I do have to give you a slap on the wrist because we run over time, but you did have a lot to cover, to be fair. And uh, this is pretty expansive sector, so I'm not too surprised by that. So I've got a couple of questions that I've selected from the audience. And also I'd like to just actually thank all of you because there's a whooping almost 300 people who have been engaged for the last hour, which is a record. And um, lots of you have sent in questions to both the chat and the Q&A section. Just a reminder, obviously, because we are running out of time, if there are any that we haven't been able to address, you can email us or comment on our LinkedIn. And one of us from Andurand or NetZero Markets will try and get back to you. So the first one, which is um, targeted towards Mark from an Oluwatomi Elizabeth. Mark, could you please help the audience to understand how voluntary credits can be important to cap and trade schemes? That seems to be an area of confusion. Um, and I know that you've answered this in one of the chat sections as well, but mm. something that people are not really understanding how the two compliance and voluntary markets Absolutely. Um, are actually yeah. communicating with each other. Yes, so to be very clear on this, I mean, I think, um, so if you look at the main um, compliance markets around the world at the moment, um, the EU ETS, as Karim said, you know, used to allow CDM credits in, CERs uh, under the Kyoto. Th those were credits created under the so-called Kyoto project mechanisms under the Kyoto protocol. But um, since 2020, the EU ETS has not allowed the import of any um, voluntary uh, credits, or let's say project-based credits, uh, to be more specific in the terminology. Now, uh, that being said, um, the um, going forward, I think this this change in the nature of the voluntary market, whereby you're going to have, uh, or the or the emissions reduction project market, where you're going to have um, credits issued that will have so-called corresponding adjustments. Effectively there, you're no longer talking about a pure voluntary market. You're talking about a quasi-compliance market because it's captured under the accounting system of the, of the Paris Agreement. So I think that's absolutely key. So I think that's when, and it's gonna take time for that to bed down. We don't yet have any project credits that carry this corresponding adjustment. And as that takes root in the next, um, I would say three years, it'll take time across different jurisdictions, um, there's going to be scope for uh, compliance schemes to import um, voluntary credits. And in fact, as I say, they won't really be voluntary credits. I should add, because they'll be quasi-compliance by definition, because they're captured under the accounting mechanism of the Paris Agreement. Pure voluntary credits uh, are not captured under the accounting system used by the Paris Agreement. That's, that's why they're different. Um, I, you know, California allows a certain number of offset credits into their market, a predefined number. So that there are jurisdictions which already allow a limited number of um, project-based credits to be used. Um, but I think going forward, there's, there's huge scope under this corresponding adjustment section of Article 6 to increase that significantly. But it will take time. Excellent, thank you. And as, as a follow-up to that, there's a question from James Harris talking about, do you see bilateral agreements gaining traction and what are the bottlenecks in your opinion? So I suppose that one good example of that would be the first one that was signed relating to Article 6 between Peru and I think it was Switzerland two years ago. And Karim, yeah. feel free to jump in as well. Obviously, you also have a view on this. 
Yes, well, I mean, I, I think clearly there will be some countries and some jurisdictions, Europe is, is a good example, that are running faster than others to achieve their Paris Agreement targets. And over time, pressure in those jurisdictions will uh, increase. And I think this is the whole logic of the Paris Agreement. The ratcheting up mechanism is the, is the genius that underlies the entire Paris Agreement. And so over time, you would expect to see increasing urgency and an acceleration of emissions reduction targets across the entire globe. But inevitably, some jurisdictions will run uh, faster than others. And those jurisdictions, I think, will, as the prototype agreement between between Switzerland and um, Peru has shown enable this kind of emissions trading between sovereign states that effectively have a compliance obligation under the Paris Agreement to enter into deals. So Article 6 uh, basically allows um, uh, trading of carbon credits between both sovereign states that have uh, compliance obligations under the uh, Paris Agreement and for private sector entities to purchase credits um, uh, under the Paris Agreement as well, under Article 6. So you're going to have bilateral deals between sovereign states, and you're going to have uh, deals between sovereign state governments and private sector entities. Huge potential. And Krim, do you have anything to add on this? Sorry, I think Mark, I think Mark's covered that pretty pretty well, I think. OK. Absolutely no complaint there. That was an excellent explanation. Thank you, Mark. And I'm going to just make this the last one as I'm aware that it is 10 past three now. Um, there is a question from an Elvis Simon who actually you have asked two questions. I would suggest that you actually come back and ask your other question on Wednesday the 25th as I think it might be more pertinent to the panel then. But you've said many countries do not currently have a carbon trading regulatory framework. So how can those who are investing and looking to get involved from a financial perspective be in, uh, supported to enable regulated trading and prevent things like fraud or cheating? This is quite a big question. Basically, we're asking how do you set up a fundamental regulatory framework at a national level without there being official government backing, which is quite a significant struggle. I, I, I can start by saying um, there are actually, as, as Mark has already pointed out, there are actually very few jurisdictions that have put into place um, actual regulations in terms of carbon trading, in terms of carbon trading schemes. Most, the vast majority of the market is voluntary based. However, having said that, um, there are supranational bodies. So the registries, um, the standards, are all supranational. Um, they operate in many, many geographies. The various verifiers, independent validators and verifiers operate in, 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 in different regions, in different locations. And so by working with those bodies, I think um, I think they can really cover the entire globe, even if they're even if the local government doesn't necessarily have in place any kind of infrastructure or any kind of regulations. Okay, excellent. Thank you for that answer. And thank you all to the audience for engaging so much during the session. It has been really a pleasure to see there's so much interest in the voluntary carbon markets um, and such a diversity of questions as well. Some from people who seem to be project developers, as well as investors, as well as corporate offsetters. Um, I'd like to say thanks to our partners at European Energy Exchange, Air Carbon Exchange and Momo Media, as well as Karim and Mark themselves for both their knowledge and their time. Thanks very we much. We hope to see you. Thank you, Mark. We hope to see you at 11 a.m. BST next, next Wednesday for our panel on avoiding the pitfalls of the voluntary carbon markets, which will feature someone from uh, Redshore Advisors as well as the London Stock Exchange Group. And this is a session that will be aimed more towards offsetting businesses as well as investors wanting to get involved. We hope to see you there and we will have these recordings up on our website very shortly. Thank you all. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. You watch, you watch, if we never, if we never change.